Hello everyone, um, we're just going to get started. Um, yeah, I see the recording has begun. Um, my name is Frances Madden, um, I'm based at the British Library and thank you for coming to this session about the uh, Freya Knowledge Hub and training materials. So we're talking all about training materials for persistent identifiers and I'm very happy to be joined today by uh, my colleague in the, pro the project, uh, Renee van Hork, and um, also we've invited Urshma Tatshifra um, to give her view on these materials as well. Um, so just before we um, get going properly, um, here is our agenda for today. And um, just so you're aware, um, as you um, have probably seen already, this session is being recorded. You have, um, um, you can unmute your microphone um, during the questions and answer session, or um, if, you, if you have a question to ask, um, we'd encourage you to use the chat as well um, for any comments or questions. Um, but otherwise, um, as I said, we're um, talking about tr um, training materials for persistent identifiers. And with that, I will hand over to Renee, to, um, who will um, give an introduction and an overview. So over to you, Renee. Thanks. Thanks, um, Francis. Um, I suppose you can hear me. Can somebody confirm? Yes. OK. So uh, thanks again, friends. For, for, uh, so um, I'll start with a short introduction. So um, we, um, uh, and the first part, what we do is uh, an introduction and overview of PIT training materials. Um, but my first slide contains a, a couple of uh, questions that you can ask uh, with respect to persistent identifiers. There is a lot to learn in the field of persistent identifiers. What is a PIT? How much does it cost? Uh, where can I find training material? I hope that we elaborate on this today. What happens is the service stops operation. How to resolve a PIT to identity? What if the PIT entity is moved? Are PITs really persistent? A good question. What happens with the PIT if the related entity is deleted? How do I choose the optimal PIT for an identity? I think we also come with an answer to that. What happens if the pit um, uh, with the pit if the entity has a new version? Um, what is a pit graph? I think uh, we already covered that uh, in uh, other sessions in this conference. Where can I find metadata of the entity that has a pit? And then how can I connect entities by means of their by means of the pit position identifier? How can I be sure that the pit will be resolvable in the long run? And um, what is the benefit of using PITs? And the last question here is what have PITs to do with fair data? When you see these, uh, it's about 18 questions. I think uh, in the audience there will people come up with more questions. So there is a lot to be asked and to learn in the field of persistent identifiers. And in this session, we try to, yeah, to uh, give an overview of um, some learning materials that are available to uh, at least um, answer some of these questions, but uh, not all. I don't have the. Uh, I don't think that that is possible. But to the next slide, for, uh, uh, before we we um, we um, we uh, cover a, a material that is provided by the Freya project that. Um, uh, I assume that all of you are familiar with what the Freya project is, and I will uh, provide some insight in what uh, what material is created by uh, Freya. Uh, but we start with um, other uh, material, um, and uh, that is um, and um, uh, so I will come back to that in the next presentation. So uh, when I talk about what Freya a pro a project create provided uh, a training and also. Um, uh, uh, Francis will 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 co cover that. But by first, um, first I also would like to point you to some other examples that is not Freya created uh, uh, training material. So next slide, please, Francis. So here you see example one. This is um, this is um, uh, a Dutch initiative, but uh, uh, and it's a persistent identifier guide. With the URL is on the slide below where you uh, can, uh, as a user, can uh, have to answer a couple of questions. 
and you can then give it a, um, a weight. So whether you are st strongly disagree or strongly agree and everything between it, depending on, on the answers you give, the guide will um, then uh, advise you to use a specific uh, position persist identifier. And uh, I think this is a very good um, uh, 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 guide to, um, for you to, to, uh, uh, to help you to decide which position identifier to use. It, um, there are a couple of themes covered. And uh, in this slide, you only see um, one uh, small part of it. So what, um, uh, um, what, what's the type of, what's the entity you would like to, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to resolve in this case uh, as, as written publications as books, etc., or are it physical objects or are it, uh, and, the, and position eight has to do with um, objects without metadata. And there are much more questions. So I think this is a very good uh, training op, uh, a training material for position identifiers. The position identifier guide created by the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. The next example is from the other side of the world, from Australia. It's from the Australian National um, uh, Data Service. And it's, um, um, and they, uh, they also uh, uh, give it the name a guide and where, where there are, uh, it's more a frequently asked question uh, approach. So um, uh, for, for, they have um, uh, uh, basic information. They start, what is a position identifier? And why do you need it? And then you can uh, read uh, the guide and uh, be informed on, um, on a specific, uh, uh, issues in relation to position identifiers. And on the right, you see a nice graphic of um, how, uh, uh, in this case, a digital a DOI helps you to build the culture of data citation, how it, how it, how, what, 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 what uh, the, the, the place of the DOI is in the, in the publication landscape. So these two examples, I would like to uh, give you as, a, as an introduction of, um, and, and as an example of material that's around there. And these two things are very, uh, they represent um, that, that material that is available. And I think now we focus more on um, the training material created by Freya. So um, we now zoom in. And so Francis, you will cover this. Eh? Yeah, thanks Renee. Um, so I am going to talk about um, one of the major training materials that were, or special training materials, I suppose, that were created within um, the Freya project, which is the Freya Knowledge Hub. So I just thought I'd show a picture of, I suppose, what might be a kind of traditional um, perception of what a Knowledge Hub might be, maybe a bit old fashioned. Um, a library. I work at the British Library, so this is kind of um, this isn't what the British Library looked like, but it is um, that kind of idea of some place that might you know be considered inaccessible um, in in some respects, um, and that is not really what we wanted to do. But to give you a bit of background to the Knowledge Hub, um, it was created originally um, within the Thor project which was the predecessor project to Freya, which again was um, looking at um, expanding the position identifier infrastructure. And it was created, I suppose, between about 2015 and 2017. And um, within Freya then, we were tasked with um, expanding the Knowledge Hub and updating it and adapting it um, to suit the needs of Freya. And, we sort of began this task in earnest in about January 2019. But um, the original Knowledge Hub was based on a readme.io site, but something else happened um, in early 2019, which um, caused us to kind of change course a little bit. Um, which was, the thing that happened was that the Pit Forum website was launched, so pitforum.org. Um, this is a screen grab of uh, pitforum.org in January 2019. So when it was brand new, and um, it, was, it was launched as a discussion forum and a place, you know, we had a session about Pit Forum yesterday. Um, 
it's been very successful in terms of um, the amount of content that's on it now. And we decided that um, the Knowledge Hub would probably be best find its home on pigforum.org. And the reasons for this were that we wanted to be able to locate all the information in one place. You know, we didn't want to sort of have two places within the one project where you go to find information. And also the Pig Forum was new at this time. So, you know, this seemed like a really good reason to um, direct people to um, the Pig Forum site as well. So we decided to, um, to locate the sort of vi revised knowledge hub on pigforum.org. Now, because uh, pigforum.org is hosted on Discourse and it's more of a discussion platform, um, we sort of have to have a think a bit about the different types of content that we'd have that might be a bit different to what was there before. And um, so we decided to focus on the basics of persistent identifiers and sort of um, resources that were kind of kids for beginners. And um, one thing that the um, previous version of the Knowledge Hub had had was these focuses on different audiences. So they had things like kids for publishers, kids for librarians and repository managers. And we thought that those were very useful because, um, you know, different people who work in different roles um, sort of see the importance of persistent identifiers in different ways and use them in different ways and interact with the providers in different ways. Um, we also had to acknowledge that the interface was a bit different. So, you know, it was more interactive. It was more, it lent itself more to sort of shorter form um, types of content. Um, but we developed an initial version of the Knowledge Hub in August 2019 and then had revisions in February 2020. So this is just a screen grab of um, what, the, um, what the Knowledge Hub looks like. Um, so it's a, it's a, you click through from the homepage of the PID Forum and um, you can see these resources. And um, this isn't all of them, um, but it gives you sort of, a, we have divided them into these subcategories for the different audiences and we have a diff getting started section as well. Um, so from when we launched the initial version in August, um, we, had, we tried to gather feedback and um, we had some very useful feedback, which resulted in some further developments. And um, one of the, um, our Freya ambassadors provided feedback, but also we had a session um, on the Pit Forum at Pitapalooza in January this year. And um, from that, we had some really good ideas, such as including a page called Why Use Persistent Identifiers? Because it became clear that there was quite a lot of appetite for some more information about how to articulate the value of persistent identifiers, um, which we really wanted to try and communicate as best we could. And we thought that that was something we could support quite well um, within Freya. Um, also, a lot of the work of Freya had focused on new types of persistent identifiers, and that wasn't really reflected in the original Knowledge Hub. So we thought it would be good to try and um, bring that out a bit more. Another thing that came out from Pitapalooza was the idea of creating resources in language or languages other than English. And I spoke about this at the session this morning with them um, about the ambassadors. So we asked the Freya ambassadors if they'd be willing to translate some resources into their own languages. Um, and um, several of them agreed to do so. And we asked them to do this why use persistent identifiers page in the first instance, because we thought that that was kind of a really nice starting point for that and you know that that was a very useful resource that for it to be available in in as many languages as possible and um, since then we've also included some more content that's been created within Freya and um, including the power of pids video which you can see at the Freya booth if you so desire um, or on our youtube channel and um, we also included the guides um, to choosing the persistent identifier to choosing persistent identifiers sorry which Renee is going to speak about in a few minutes. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say a word about um, sustainability and about what's going to happen to the Knowledge Hub now. Um, Frey is a project, it's a project which is ending in a couple of weeks. And one thing we did learn from the first um, version of the Knowledge Hub is that it like these resources can go out of date very quickly. Um, we could see that with the knowledge of it. So it wasn't updated for maybe a year, year and a half. And it was, you know, a lot of the stuff did need to be um, updated. Um, so we explored different 
ways in which we could sort of ensure that this resource would, would continue to be curated. And if I'm, I suppose, none of the options really were ideal. We looked at things like, could we migrate the content to Wikipedia? Um, and we sort of decided against that because we'd have to basically change all the content because it's sort of, you know, Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, it's not um, a set of training materials. And um, the risk of sort of things being handed over to the community and the fact that things just get neglected and go out of date um, remained. So what we eventually decided to do was it's been passed over to the administrators of the pitforum.org site. Um, fortunately, the pitforum.org has been taken over by NISO and they've got plans for it. And, you know, um, there was a session about the pitforum yesterday and um, the Knowledge Hub was mentioned. Um, so I'm very hopeful that it will continue to be updated, but it is very difficult to sustain these types of um, resources. And we are reliant on the community sort of keeping it up in the future. So um, that's um, just one of those one of those things with, with these resources. And um, I'd be very interested to hear um, your views during the um, Q&A later on around, around this point particularly. Um, so that was all I had to say about the Knowledge Hub. And I'm going to hand back again to Renee now to speak about the guide. Yes, thanks, uh, Francis. Here I am again. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, another uh, example of uh, training material that we created in the Freya project are so-called um, also a pit guides. We also often spoke about um, uh, pit uh, decision trees. So maybe the next slide, uh, uh, Francis. Um, yeah, so uh, a decision tree, uh, you could think, of, as there are uh, uh, several uh, alternatives for choosing pits, it's quite obvious to think that there is a kind of uh, tree that, um, with yes, no questions, that leads you the right way from starting at the object to the most suitable uh, identifier. That was the initial idea. And we also, and I will show you um, what we did, that we also succeeded in to a certain extent, but it turned out to be sometimes more difficult because the, 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 some choices are not always very binary. I will come back to that later. So we, in, uh, in, in it was in, um, um, I think in, yeah, in, uh, in May, 2018, yeah, May 2018, there was a Freya report uh, published, report three, deliverable 3.1, and it's named Survey of Pit Services Landscape. And, um, and uh, in that report, there were 25 entities or objects that can be um, identified with the pit. They were covered in this uh, landscape uh, report. Um, and um, uh, it will not surprise you that the the five ones for which we created guides, publications, data set, people, organization, and software. They were among these 25. There were 20 others as well. Um, uh, for instance, conferences, uh, grants, uh, data repositories, experiments, equipment, etc. So now you are very curious, so you can go to the link and uh, have a look. Um, but not all these entities, um, uh, the pits for these entities have uh, enough maturity um, to, um, can you please go back? Yeah, have enough maturity to, to, uh, to become a, a candidate for uh, creating this uh, pit uh, tree or guide. So uh, we ended, after uh, this evaluation, we, um, of the 25 entities, we think that uh, the, the, the five entities, uh, publications, dates that people, organizations, they are more or less mature and uh, suitable for, um, for uh, creating this, this, this decision tree. So the next slide is, and uh, now I'm going to give you a short overview of these five guides. And uh, here you, and, and, and uh, I, I will not go into detail of, of all these, um, guides or trees. This is not, well, it is a tree because it <laughs> there's really some branches, 
but it's not um, uh, it's not a tree that is. Um, but you see that um, that uh, some uh, 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 tracks uh, uh, come uh, uh, have the same end. So a doy is mentioned very often, and the handle a couple of times, and uh, that all depends. We we decided to uh, to start the 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 guide with. Uh, um, uh, posing uh, uh, basic questions with what would you like, what would you like to, what is the function of the identifier in this case for a publication? We first, and you will recognize that we identify, we make a definition of what we mean with a uh, publication, so that's in the left box. And so, for instance, for publications, we say, would you like to identify the journal articles, or is it has to do with preprints? or the third option is uh, conference proceedings or books and journal articles, journal titles. And these basic uh, categorizations, classifications will um, yeah, determine the rest of the, of, the, of the guide and the decision tree. Um, so, um, uh, and of course, the way you pose the question is also in a sense, um, it's not uh, value free. Eh? You, you could ask, uh, would you like to have a free uh, a service, or would you like to have a, a service that has additional functionality, uh, which means it costs money. So uh, that th we had a lot of discussion in our group, and it's maybe um, maybe um, that's my personal view. It's, it's still a miracle that we that we came up because that, that with the result because it's it's very debatable. Yeah, it's 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 not as binary as we thought in advance, but I think. Yeah, we did a great job. It, uh, uh, no, yeah, because it's already downloaded almost 2,000 times um, from the Zenodo repository. So uh, there is a need for these kinds of uh, guides. And uh, we also did um, uh, a review process. Maybe we can go to the next um, um, uh, guide. Uh, so we, we first published the first version and then we invited the community to, to react on it. And, and there were indeed uh, quite some reactions and we processed them. And now we have the, this version and, and we don't think it's, uh, it's uh, perfect, but it's almost perfect. I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a great uh, guide. And if you, um, if you if, yeah, and it can be of benefit if you would like to, uh, if you would like to have more information on how to use an identifier. For here, for instance, for data sets, we make a distinction between uh, would you like to refer and cite data sets or would you like to identify data sets within internal system? And in the second option, the handle and the URN NBN is more suitable. And in the first situation, you end up with a DOI that comes with a cost, but also with uh, other functionalities and um, and um, and that means other with the other option you have to do things yourself. Uh, we, may, we, let's go to the the, the next term that, that has to do with people. Um, yeah, what I would like to mention before somebody asks in the audience, where is the ARC? The archival um, resource key is of course also a very important uh, identifier. But the, this 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 identifier is multi-purpose bit for objects of any kind. Which made it so um, uh, fluid. So, so, so uh, the, yeah, you, you can use that uh, uh, very. In a, so the, 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 the way to use the arc is, is so flexible that you could that 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 it doesn't fit in this this binary tree uh, 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 approach we uh, we we choose. Um, but it is, uh, of course, an, uh, also an identifier that is, uh, yeah, in in the, in. Um, a lot of uh, lists when, 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 when PIT systems are mentioned, but we didn't put them in our guides for the reason that I just mentioned. Um, this is with people identifiers, and uh, it will not surprise you that, of course, the ORCID in the research community is, um, is a very um, obvious candidate. And, uh, but there's also the, the Web of Science uh, research identity from the, what is it, the, the, the publishers uh, community, Scopus, are also very often used uh, uh, identifiers. And um, um, ISNI is also mentioned here. So um, that's with people. The, the next one, uh, please, uh, has to do with organizations. Uh, that was quite 
complicated. Uh, an, an obvious candidate is, of course, in the research community, is the ROAR, eh? the, 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 uh, the, the, the identifier that is, uh, that, is, that is gaining ground more and more in our community. But there's also um, yeah, um, uh, the lie that has to do with legal entities that, 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 that is uh, often used uh, identifier. Um, we also, you also see um, uh, uh, a grid, and uh, that is the global research identifier for for um, organizations. Um, and um, what I show here is only the, the 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 overview of the of the guide, and there is a second page that um, uh, gives um, information on all of the uh, pit uh, systems. So, um, so not, I, I don't show them here, but then you give a, you see a definition and also uh, what kind of business model is behind uh, each of the systems. I think we have um, the last one uh, is the is the software identifier, and um, um, yeah, here uh, besides the DOI is uh, is the hash. Um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, a cryptographic hash computed over over the software component uh, that creates a unique string is a is a um, is also a, a good candidate for persistent identification it's used by the software heritage archive and uh, that is the s w s w h idea and also other hashes commit hashes um, and um, so here we make a distinction between what do you want to do with the identifier if you credit an attribute, would like to credit an attribute software, then the DOI we think is the most appropriate candidate. Uh, for long-term preservation, both the DOI and, the, and this hash, uh, the software heritage identifier. Uh, would you like to if, uh, track the evolution of software, then uh, also the uh, commit hash is, uh, is a candidate. And the same has to do if um, reproducibility is the main um, uh, rational for, um, for, for using a persistent identifier. So I showed you now these, these five guides. Um, I showed you already the, the, the link where you can find them. And the last slide here, or the last two slides, I think, they, they both are an overview table. Yeah, you see, so you, you see now uh, in this table, uh, the use cases um, and the um, and the attributes, and then in the in the column on the left side, you see the different uh, uh, pit systems. Um, yeah, we think this is a, um, um, a valuable um, uh, a, a, a training uh, or learning component created by Freya, and uh, we hope that um, that it will be uh, used. But uh, as I said, uh, we also hope uh, yeah that uh, that. That we also hope that we see that it is um, that is also um, yeah the, depending on the use case and how we defined the um, the, the the tracks in in the decision tree um, is uh, not completely objective. We, there were, we had some some discussions on it, but we came with a good um, uh, um, balance, I think, and we also had we gave the community ample opportunity to to reflect and give us feedback. And again, uh, the fact that it is already um, used um, almost 2000 times, or I mean, downloaded is, is an indication um, we did the right thing here. But um, well, I'm more interested in, of course, if the audience agrees with that. And, uh, but um, yeah, that's, that's what, um, what I would like to say in this session on um, what uh, Freya has produced in this case, um, eh, the software, the, the PIT guides. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, um, um, Francis. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we had a question there about the um, validation and overview of um, PIDs um, there too, which I think is, is very interesting and just shows that there are so many different types of persistent identifiers. And I would, um, refer anyone to um, D3.1, um, uh, which Renee mentioned at the start of this talk for, for that, because um, there is a lot more than we were able to cover within those guides. Um, so I'm just going to speak now for a few minutes about uh, training events and event materials. 
um, which is another um, output of, of, of Freya, which um, we hope will be useful um, to users. I suppose this is a marketplace of tool session. So we wanted to um, provide as sort of as much information of things that you know people can take away and um, utilize within their own work and potentially if you're involved in giving any training or anything as well. So why am I talking about event materials, particularly at an event <laughs> as well? But um, I really like trying to make um, event materials available as much as possible um, after the event for a number of reasons. Um, I think, you know, you um, we all put so much work into creating training materials and um, it can take a lot of time. And I think particularly, you know, in a pre-2020 online world um, as well, you know, maybe not the largest number of people will see what we've done. So um, it's very nice to be able to increase the reach of the materials and um, make them as available as possible. Um, I also think um, sort of re related to what I was saying about the Knowledge Hub, um, materials as such as slides and things that are created for events, they provide quite a nice lightweight entry point for people who are um, getting familiar with a particular subject. I think as well now that we've got so many events that are being recorded, um, you get the full experience, you get to hear what a speaker has said rather than just reading their slides, because um, I know I can often personally can put quite a lot of say quite a lot more than what I write on the slide so um, it's quite it can be quite useful to um, be able to hear everything and also just you know people with different learning styles as well you know you don't have to read everything you can listen to um, also for um, people who are you know facil like facilitating training um, being able to adapt materials that have already been created that can be really useful as well and it does go to build that sort of train the trainer capacity so the types of stuff of events that we held in Freya so we had a bit of a, a mix and um, this sort of this is um, a photograph of a session um, we held at the RDA plenary in Helsinki um, back um, when we'd all get in the one room together um, and as you can see there everyone's on their laptops it was quite an interactive session um, where we had people um, using Jupyter notebooks and things. Um, we also held um, a series of ambassador webinars, um, which were mostly all recorded. Um, and those were kind of providing updates on what was happening in the project. Um, last year, we held a workshop on software citation and the materials from that are available on Zenodo. And that was sort of aimed at um, researchers, people working in kind of um, research support roles, sort of demonstrating um, research software engineers, sort of talking about the um, uh, benefits and methods and how to around software citation. Um, we also held another event in uh, December last year, um, effectively communicating your research online, um, their materials from that and a blog post as well. And available on Zenodo, the, um, both of these two were um, in-person events and um, the re um, research online event was about, it was aimed at historians or general humanists and it um, talked about um, how to manage your online presence and sort of the role that persistent identifiers can play within that um, and yeah it was aimed at sort of PhDs and post postdoctoral students or postdoctoral researchers I beg your pardon. Um, and then another sort of at the other end of the spectrum, we had an event aimed at kind of like li librarians, research support professionals, that type of audience um, at the Open Science Fair um, again last year. Um, and again, material is available online for that. That was quite a workshop based um, session. And we used the Mentimeter um, software in that. And so while we can't recreate the workshop element of it in the sense of like you know the, the sort of discussions and stuff that were had and that isn't really captured so well what we do have is the results of that in the sense that we had discussions and we asked people to input their the results of their discussions into Mentimeter and that is now available so you can sort of see the types of discussion questions that we posed to um to the to the group there um, particularly in the final year we had um, of the project, so this year basically, um, 2020, we had a lot of project webinars. Um, a lot of them were around um, the new types of PID services that were developed within Freya 
and those are all recorded and can be um can be accessed by anyone wanting to learn more about the about those services um and you if you've been at any of the sessions over the last few days um there was a session on monday all about, all about these um, new hip graph services too so where can you access these this information so we have a youtube channel um, which again is linked to from our booth and it's the uh, project for youtube you can see there and we have all the webinars up on there and we also have our power of kids video um which is something we decided to create um sort of at the beginning of this year just to try and come up with something really concise and useful for other people trying to communicate the value of persistent identifiers and also the value of the PIP graph because that was something that we knew we needed to um, do a bit better with communicating. So we hope that this video has really helped with that. And um, so I'd encourage you all to have a look at that and see if it might be useful for any um, audiences with which you're engaging. And um, we also have a, a demonstrator that was developed for EAC Pub Week, which is really useful at describing how the kind of um, the data by GraphQL API, which is sort of that engine that powers the PIP graph, how that works. Um, and then I've talked a lot about slides and things, and all of those, they're available from the phrase uh, Zenodo community. Um, and, you know, we've got well over 50 items in there. It also has, that's also where you can find our deliverables, um, which are very useful from the point of view that if you want the um, the real detail, that's where, that's where you can go. Uh, the other thing to say as well is that they're all downloadable. They've got a Creative Commons license, so you can um, adapt them and stuff as well. And also, if, if you need to, um, I think all of the webinar recordings are also available there for download. Um, rather than streaming, if, if that's what, what you need. Um, lastly, I'll just mention, um, this is a bit different, but um, for a kind of more technical audience, I mentioned we have this, um, Fred uh, developed this GraphQL API, and um, we also developed these Jupyter notebooks to sort of showcase the kind of capabilities of the API. And um, so if you're not familiar with Jupyter notebooks, they kind of um, allow you to sort of execute code and sort of document it alongside. So this is an example of, of one of the notebooks. And those are uh, um, can be accessed and viewed um, through the pipnotebooks.org website. So that's a slightly different, um, slightly different thing, but I thought it would be useful to, to show. Um, so that was all I had to say. Um, so now I'm very happy to um, hand over to Urshbet, um to hear her um, response and uh, views on, on what we've presented here thus far. Um, over to you, Urshbet. Thanks. Okay, first of all, uh, hello everyone and thanks for uh, having me today. Uh, it's an honor to, to uh, uh, having the chance to contribute to such a company. Uh, and so in my short reflection time, uh, basically what I'm trying to do is that I was uh, selecting from the most frequently occurring questions that I receive as Daria's Open Science Officer when engaging uh, in all sorts of conversations about PIDs, uh, just to uncover some of my biases. Uh, as some of you already know, some of you may not, uh, Daria is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium for um, Arts and Humanities Research. So I'm quite biased uh, in my perspective towards uh, the arts and humanities, but I think Frances, we can uh, skip on the next slide. Thanks. So the first question is a very honest one. I think uh, this comes up right after we discuss either with researchers or with uh, uh, professionals uh, in uh, uh, GLAM institutions, uh, like right after they get an understanding and the value of PIDs, usually the second question is, how much a PID system, the implementation of a, pre, a proper PID system costs uh, from the maintainer side, be this a cultural heritage institution, an academic institution, uh, a research project team or whatever. Uh, from the side of the individual researcher, what we see is that it's quite an emerging community practice, just simply, you know, putting uh, 
uh, the research on a thematic or generic repository, for instance, Zenodo, and then they receive a DOI for free. Um, in brackets, of course, uh, this is not free free. Somebody needs to pay for that. Uh, but so um, this is basically a question that we can discuss later if we will have time. Um, how do you include this very crucial, sometimes quite painful cost aspects uh, of um, using and implementing PIDs or PID systems? So this is uh, one of my uh, uh, questions slash comments. Uh, I think we can go to the second one and then uh, discuss uh, the two of them later. The second thing that I see is probably when explaining PIDs and engaging in all sorts of discussions about PIDs is that at least in the context of research workflows, one of the biggest epistemological twists that happen when talking about PIDs is that uh, unlike other standardized units of scholarship, and by this I mean books uh, apparently, um, PIDs uh, can cover, like under a PID, people can find uh, scholarly objects that, that are on a very, very wide range of granularity. Uh, here I put you an example, like on the other hand, we have uh, whole research facilities that are made citable uh, through a PID, right? Or we have, uh, for instance, in the social sciences, large, uh, survey data sets uh, uh, that are like massive complex constructions in themselves deposited under one single PID. Uh, and on the other end of the granularity, uh, especially in a humanities context, you know, we, we have a tendency to focus on the nitty gritties. So uh, in our practices, a certain passage of a certain manuscript can, uh, um, be made citable persistently by, by a PID or an interesting stamp in a manuscript or whatever. So um, it's 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 very difficult sometimes to assess these granularity issues when using PIDs. What are the best practices in terms of granularity? How research teams can decide about this? Uh, what are the golden measures uh, and how these granularity issues could um, have been uh, integrated in your advocacy work at Freya. The, these were two questions, the cost and the granularity that will probably uh, excited me the most. So I think uh, that, was my, that was my contribution. Thanks, Erishvesh. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen at this point. And we've got just a few minutes um, for a little bit of discussion. Um, Renee, I think some of these questions that Erishvesh has raised were sort of things you touched on in your talk about the guides. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, the, um, uh, I'm glad I, uh, I uh, said something on the ARC because um, it's very prominent in your slides. Yeah. And then it was quoted by somebody, well, the DOI is too expensive. And I, 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 I prefer the ARC as it is used by the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. They use the BNF as the, as the reference. Is that correct? Yeah, I thought. It, but the BNF has to set up then also an infrastructure for, um, for um, adding, meta, uh, connecting metadata to the ARC and to, um, to set up the resolver. So um, in the end, uh, you're right, you already said it. Um, um, uh, the bits are not for free. So um, yeah, whether you choose um, an existing service or set it up yourself is also a policy uh, discussion. And um, yeah, we had a lot of discussion on that in our, and when we created the guides. And um, yeah, Francis was really good in, uh, in finding the right um, compromise and, and and so we, we we kept on track because you can get lost in these discussions huh? so you get you all uh, and uh, and um yeah so so um uh, and obvious we have we have data site in freya so we are not completely uh, I, uh, I of course i admit we are not completely um, objective or value free here um um, so that's my reaction on your first uh, option, on, and, and um, the second one with the granularity. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, and diversity. 
Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. The, 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 yeah. That's that. That what 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 actually is the object you are identifying is is an issue, of course, and. Um, Mm, I don't have a clear answer on that. I know, of course, if, uh, versioning is also um, an issue that is coped with more or less. Eh? Even in Zenodo, eh? they, if you have different versions, they, they, they have a solution with, that you, you can still resolve it with, fraction, with fragments. Uh, I don't know, maybe there is somebody in the audience that I know that if, if you have an interview and you have that identified with an identify uh, with a bit, you, you can also identify a, a fragment by adding time codes to it or something like that. But I'm not an expert in this. I'm not an expert in this. Ah, I see somebody uh, who wants to say something. Yeah. Also, if anyone, you, has, you, 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 you help me. Time, if anyone has any questions, please add them to the chat and we'll try and address them before we close. Yeah. But I see Ua has also something to say on this, so. Uh... Yeah, Uwe, we can't hear you. Is this better? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, so, sorry, yeah. I, I just want to say, so the problem with the granularity is also existing, of course, with data sets, um, because sometimes you have a data, uh, many data sets for a specific publication they're linked together then they want to have a UI for, for the whole thing to download that as a zip. We know that, uh, so the problem here is of course, um, if you have uh, references and you want to do something like citation counting, then it gets complicated. And we were talking in, about that in Freya in the same way. The most important thing on that is what we figured out and what data site is doing is uh, to keep uh, the links between those uh, persistent identifiers. So in data side, you have part of, uh, and um, so 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 the childs are referring to the parents. But in general, um, uh, it it also depends on what what the user is doing. If he refers to the whole book, uh, he can of course cite the whole book. But in another case, you can also make a reference to only a chapter. So the problem also exists in, in the library sense where you have those, your, those standard in notations. So there is no real solution um, for, for everything. I think the hardest part is for people counting citations or references on that. I see no problem uh, with assigning multiple identifiers uh, to the same piece of work just for different parts of it. So I, I also heard that publishers are starting sometimes to assign DUIs to specific pictures in the papers. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, diversity is not, uh, or, or sorry, not the diversity, the granularity issue is not something that is, um, it exists across many domains, I think. Um, the other point I would like to say um, as well about the diversity of PIDs is that that was one of the major motivations for making the guides. Um, in the first place was to try and help um, users who are interested in using persistent identifiers to try and navigate which type of identifier they need for a particular for their particular use case. Yeah. Um, because it, yeah, that was something that we were getting consistently in feedback was that people needed help with that issue and that they were struggling with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, as Renee said, they're not entirely comprehensive by any means, but they were sort of just a starting point to sort of get people on the right track with what the differences are between the various identifiers. Um, are there any more questions? I'm conscious we are almost five minutes over time, so I am sorry we haven't had more chance for discussion. Does anyone have any last comments to make before we close the session? I'm going to take that silence as a no in that case. But um, I would like to thank um, everyone for coming. Um, it's nice to see so many people, if you could, most of you have stayed around, um, even though we're over time. And um, thank you to Renee and Erschwitt. And um, I will close the session now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. I will end the session and that would also stop the recording. Thanks, everybody. It was a really great session. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Much appreciated.